The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. Thank you. Wow, Santa Barbara. Wow. Thank you very much. I feel like a rock star or something here. I was very intimidated when my friends who live here told me that the university uh, had decided that there wasn't enough room there and they were going to move it to the Arlington Theater and I thought well where is the Arlington Theater and who was last speaking there I said don't worry President Clinton was here he almost filled it <laughs> so I was very intimidated now I, I am grateful to to Roman for the thank you list and I won't repeat that I'm, I'm very grateful to be here I won't do this all night either I promise I'm very grateful to be here I've never been to Santa Barbara before um, and uh, Roman mentioned that the library was a jewel in the city of Santa Barbara, and I'm sure that's true, but the whole city looks like a jewel to me. And as I mentioned uh, the other night, I've decided that, although I very much enjoyed my career in Haiti and Rwanda, I won't be leaving tomorrow as planned. I'm actually moving to Santa Barbara now, and <clears throat> that means none of you will support our work anymore if I do that, so... Anyway, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I, I, I'm very grateful to the university, to the library system, all those who organized uh, this, um, and I look forward to spending um, the evening here. I won't be rushing off um, afterwards. I'm looking forward to an exchange with all of you. I'm going to uh, use the example that Tom just did, Thomas Tog just did, um, as a way of thinking, and the example he used was AIDS and AIDS treatment. And the, I'm not using it because the details are important to everyone in this audience. And I hope there are, are there students from UCSB here, may I ask? Yes, yay. That was a rather weak showing, I'd say. <laughs> At least that your, your school mascot is not the, you know, slug. That's UC Santa Cruz, right? <laughs> what is the mascot here? I think the, the, state, uh, the state sediment should be ash, by the way. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Um, I showed up here and the first thing I bought was asthma medicine. But anyway, <laughs> I'm going to use this specific example of, of AIDS, what, you know, what to do. But it's not because I think the specifics are, they're important to me and they're important to the people I take care of and their families. And, but the larger questions are important too. And these are questions that I've called here uh, global health equity. There, there may be a better way to say this. Um, global health equity, I've used this term because it's, I'm not talking about international health. You know, you have equity problems right here in this state, right here in this county. And we, we do in Boston, we do certainly in our country, enormous problems, disparity of access to care, disparity of risk, um, and so when I say global, I am not suggesting that Santa Barbara isn't on the globe or that California isn't on the globe or that Boston isn't on the globe or Mississippi, Louisiana. So it's not the same as international health. I won't talk about international health. And equity is obviously a way, obviously a way at getting at the issue of justice of, and even rights. And I'll be starting with some very specific questions about HIV, but moving on to rights. Uh, right away. So here, let me just start with these images that I have found compelling. And I've been using them in teaching. I teach mostly medical students and doctors. 
Um, but I've been using this not also with medical students, and it's surely it's a. Com I, it, you can get this. There's the address of the website right there. I, I, it's um, surely a computer uh, modeling exercise, which shapes the globe based on certain parameters. Here, HIV prevalence now. HIV, as you know, is the virus that causes AIDS, although some in California have disputed this in my visits here. That was supposed to make you laugh. <laughs> I've also had people in California ask me how crystals play a role in my healing of AIDS, and the answer was, you know, not a large one. Anyway, um, so this is, uh, this is really to tell you just how concentrated a problem AIDS is in the world right now. And, and next to this, uh, I, you could put many other, here, so take a look, there's Africa in terms of a HIV prevalence, this is Africa in terms of physicians working. Now, uh, physicians are not the answer to the HIV problem, but we will play a role uh, in responding to a problem like this, and I'm going to show you what we've done. Uh, Thomas was good enough to, to really lay out our approach, which has uh, been to incorporate notions of equity and justice and even rights into our response. But that's not enough to say, you know, you have to have a right to health care. That doesn't get you very far, I've found. It can help orient discussion, but it doesn't answer the problem. You need, you know, ways of moving forward. Now, let me go to the specifics again. Um, and I should be mortified that I do this, but um, a friend of mine is here from the Clinton Foundation, and I'd like to say that um, she and many others from the Clinton Foundation have been our primary partners in uh, helping to drop the price of HIV drugs and to ma expand our work in Africa, and I'll return to that in a second. But first I want to say that in 2002, um, I would like to say I made this slide, but I didn't. I was in Haiti. Uh, and we had put in place um, internet connections um, in all the places we work in Haiti. And I sent an email to uh, a research assistant at Harvard, and I said um, how much... I actually had seen... Tom, Thomas Tig mentioned The Lancet. Now, I know all of you read The Lancet every week without fail. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Don't you love the name of our names of medical journals? They're sort of downwardly mobile, aren't they? <laughs> the name of the main medical journal of the American Gastroenterologist uh, Association is called Gut. <laughs> uh, this is true. Anyway, Lancet, in spite of its, its kind of cheesy name, is, is a very high-profile pro medical journal. And in 2002, which was the year after, we wrote the piece that Thomas mentioned, saying, you know, you really need to think about how to treat HIV if you also want to prevent it. You can't just say, no, these lives are lost. But a year later, just before there was this big meeting in, uh, in, in Spain, every two years there's a huge meeting, uh, you know, about AIDS. And, the, and, and uh, thousands, really tens of thousands of people show up. And I had been, I swore them off in 2000. I went to my last one in, in Durban, South Africa. I said, um, but then, of course, I got invited to give a plenary address, and I changed my mind. I'm glad you laughed because people said, I thought you said you'd never go to another of these meetings. I changed my mind. I was in Haiti and I thought, I'm going to write out every word of my talk and I want everything to be well researched. Tom, also, thank you for noticing that my last book was so well researched. I met someone who I won't mention by name, but here's here today, and she met me two nights ago and she said, I read your book, it's long, dry, and boring. <laughs> I know she's here, I just saw her. I said, thank you, I'll keep my day job. Anyway, I was trying, I, the reason they're long, dry, and boring is I try to, to document anything I'm, I'm going to say, because since it's so controversial to make, to say something like, it's really controversial to say, you know, the poor deserve medical care too. So, yeah, why is that so controversial? Now, if you want to bomb a country, knock yourself out. You don't need any documentation, you don't have to prove anything, but if you want to treat poor people, you really need to document it. Anyway, so this is sort of our little WMD thing here. I was working on documenting everything, and I read a paper in The Lancet, and it said, you know, it's, it's 28 times more cost-effective to prevent HIV than to treat it. And I, I've said to my, my medical students, you can tell often when someone makes a statement to start a conversation or to end it. 
And I had the feeling in reading this that this was not a good conversation starter about HIV treatment in Africa. In 2002, there's no formal funding mechanism yet in the world to, to treat AIDS in Africa or Haiti or any other place where poor people can't buy these drugs. So I looked at the paper and I couldn't see on the internet in Haiti, I couldn't see what the references were. I could see the footnotes. And people like me, nerds, we love footnotes. We, I have in that book that was long, dry, and boring, I have footnotes that are two pages long in tiny font. <laughs> so I think my critic had a point there. But anyway, I call those punitive footnotes, by the way. Anyway, uh, my fellow nerds will recognize. Anyway, so I was asking this young woman uh, up in Boston, what, what are these references? Two of them. And, she, and it turns out one was... A, an, a, compu you know, a computer modeling exercise like the maps I showed you, so not based on real data necessarily. And the other was data from a costing exercise that was part of a future project in West Africa. So they had no real data on how much it cost. Now this, this notion of cost effectiveness is basically now our, our national religion in international, or international religion, international health. So someone says, oh well it's not cost effective. That's again, that's the end of the conversation. You know, I have a lot of patients who have cancer in Haiti or Africa where, i got news for you, they also get cancer in addition to AIDS, tuberculosis, they get cancer. And people will say, well, it's not cost effective to treat cancer in, in Haiti. Now, I used to be intimidated by that about 10 years ago. I thought, well, you know, they're economists, they have arcane knowledge, they're smarter than us. I am not worthy. Aerosmith. <laughs> and... Um, but then I started asking, what, what is this all about? And it was really very simple. It was about the, the GDP of the country you're talking about. That's it. You know, all of these complex formulas, like one was called WTP. And I, I was in a conference again, and this guy was flashing uh, slides up on the screen. It said WTP, WTP, and it was by country. And WTP, and I said, what's WTP? Willingness to pay. I said, well, what's that based on? I mean... Say, for example, you're a 15-year-old you're a and your mother has cancer and you're one of five children. What's, what is your willingness to pay based on? And, you know, it was, again, just how much does an individual make in this country, GDP? Anyway, incredibly primitive stuff, I thought, once I started looking at it. So I said to my coworker, let's make a slide that shows how much the average cost of an AIDS treatment regimen is. It's called ART, means antiretroviral therapy. And that's the average wholesale price for uh, two regimens. The infectious disease nerds among you will be interested in which they are, so I've labeled them. $10,000 per patient per year. And in 2002, I said, so what are we paying with a mix of generic and concessional prices from the big pharma industry? And we were paying between six and $700 a year. And then this is before the Clinton Foundation came and renegotiated a lot of these prices for us. The International Dispensary Association in the Netherlands, where they know how to make great levies, um, they were, they were, sorry, they were already renegotiating the prices for us about 300 to 400 dollars a year. So my question was this, you know, when I when I went to this big conference in Spain, was how do we know what's cost effective if costs are changing so rapidly? To say nothing of the fact that we don't have any effective treatment for AIDS other than antiretroviral therapy. And, you know, it was a very simple question, you know, but it started a little firestorm in the public health community that it isn't over yet. Now, the good thing is that among many people who are working, obviously, especially AIDS activists to whom we have a great debt, I know we do, our organization, but we said, we've got to figure out a way to do this um, and we will drive the prices down. And, and that's what happened, as some of you know. But the, the figure now is, uh, it's about $100 per patient per year for a generic regimen. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. Now, that's the economics background, economics 101. Um, but there are obviously very different ways of measuring the impact of this epidemic or failure to treat failure to take care of people. And I'm going to show, some of you have seen these images, but most of you not. But I'm just going to talk about this from the point of view of a, a patient or a, a doctor. Let me skip ahead. We have a huge project in Haiti. I'll tell you about it. But let me skip ahead. So this is a guy named Joseph 
who, that's his mother, of course, and if it weren't for her, he wouldn't have been, he'd come in. But I want to tell you two things about the date here. It's March 2003. In August 2002, we had promised people in his hometown, which is really a small city in Haiti, that we would introduce proper AIDS care in their public clinic. Now, there's lots in that statement. Remember the public clinic part. Because we hadn't been working in the public clinic. We'd been, we built our own clinics in the hospital, also in central Haiti. And they were, they, they were in our very nice, some of you have been to visit us there. But we asked about, after 10, 15 years of working there, okay, we're doing a lot of things right, but what are we doing that's wrong? And we decided that one of the things we were doing that was, wasn't good enough in any case was we hadn't been working to strengthen the public sector. So we went into the public sector and in August 2002 and said, we're going to start this project here. We're going to get funding from a new funding mechanism called the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, and the, and the money didn't get there. So August comes around and, you know, we're calling Boston and saying, you know, what are we going to do? And some of you may know what we did do. We took out a loan from a commercial bank, Partners in Health, which is, you know, not a big organization at the time. It still isn't. We took out a loan for $2.1 million from a commercial bank, which, you know, was certainly, we'd never taken out a loan before. And we are glad we did because we kept our promise to this community and noticed the date when he showed up, March 2003, which was still... Uh, but I'm not sure that even by March that we'd received the funding for the global fund, that from the Global Fund. It eventually arrived, but it was almost a year late. Now, this guy had given up, and Joseph. And, uh, but his mother and neighbors carried him in to this public clinic that we'd, been, that we'd refurbished on a stretcher. He was... What, what we call in medical jargon, he was obtunded. He, he couldn't really wake up. and wasn't talking. And I got a, an email. I told you we use email a lot. And, and uh, if someone would have said to me 10 years ago, you'll be using high-speed internet in rural Haiti, I would have said, but there are no landlines. And they would have said, that's why you're going to use high-speed internet. I, but I learned, you learn things in this work. So anyway, we had high-speed internet access. And I got a note from a former student of mine who's a doctor there now, an American. And... He took these pictures, and he said, there's a patient we want you to see here in Las Cabas. That's the name of the town. Actually, this is the town where Direct Relief International just sent us a whole container full of stuff, and I still think that's related to this Santa Barbara Reads exclamation point. Um, in any case, I got an email from the doctors there, one of them, and saying, you know, Paul, we'd really like you to come and see this patient. And he has, you know, AIDS and a CD4. I get all the information, and tuberculosis. And I should have just left it at that, right? You know, to say, oh, well, that's great that they want me to come and help them, my students and trainees. But instead, I made the mistake of saying, oh, really, why do you want me to come and see him? I mean, this is pretty straightforward. He's got AIDS, got TB, you know what to do. I was hoping, of course, that they would say, because you are the world's greatest infectious disease doctor. <laughs> but no, they did not say that. They said, because he's depressed. And then I want to say, what am I, clowns without borders? You know, I'm a Harvard-trained infectious disease doctor. Anyway, so I went to see him. I like Clowns Without Borders. Don't get, wrong, don't get mad. I mean, people in Santa Barbara probably fund half the organization. Anyway, <laughs> so I went to see him, and I did talk to him. And I, I really, you know, I, I got him to sit up and talk to me. And I said, Joseph. By the way, he turned out to be a very funny guy. You wouldn't know. He's hilarious. When I asked him if I could use his pictures, he said, yeah, it's not like I ever get invited to give these fancy talks. I got him back for that later, as you'll soon learn. Anyway, um, so I said, you know, Joseph, if you take these medicines and have a community health worker, you will get better. And he said, I, I don't really believe that. And I said, oh, you will. And he did. And uh, I know, I, I, get, I get worked up when I see these pictures. I got more for you, too. Um, and I, I think everybody up there can see them as well. But, you know, this transformation of someone's life is a marvelous thing. You know, if you spend 40 years as a doctor in clinical practice and you see some, this one time, it's a great thing, or a nurse, you know, but if you see it all the time, as we do, it's very inspiring. Anyway, so we, this transformation doesn't st stop here. 
you know, it doesn't stop with someone like Joseph getting, coming back from the grave. Um, you know, he got involved in our work. So here's the model, you know, which it ain't rocket science. Community health worker visits him. That's him at home with this community health worker. But the transformation continued because here's Joseph giving a speech in front of a big crowd with a microphone in front of the same pictures that I'm using. You see them in the background. And I sent these pictures with his blessing to my friend Jim Kim at the World Health Organization who had left Partners in Health in Harvard in 2003, 2004, about this time, to start a big treatment effort or to move it forward. It's called 3 by 5 3 million people on therapy by 2005. And he put these pictures into the World Health Report. And I got the World Health Report, and I said, well, I'm going to bring this back to Joseph. I gave it to Joseph, and he looked at it and said, yeah, I'm a star. <laughs> he's, he's a funny guy. Now, the question that was asked about transformations, my colleagues in public health, and I consider myself a public health specialist too, if that's okay with you, um, say, yeah, but can this, be, can this be scaled up? Those of you who are in public health or going into public health will soon discover what might be called the fetishization of scaling up. Everybody talks about scaling up all day, every day, all night. You know, if they drink coffee, it's ten times worse. So, you know, we thought, well, yeah, we can scale it up. We just need the money. And then we'll go into the public sector institutions. And some of you will want to talk about why public sector institutions. And I live in a place called Conge, and, and many of you, several of you here tonight have been to visit there. That's where we built a big referral hospital. But all the other red dots are public sector institutions where we have brought in this comprehensive model of care, which includes women's health, tuberculosis care, primary health care in general. And we've also, at the same time, literally rebuilt physically the infrastructures, sometimes from scratch, like we're doing now with that's what we're doing with the D Direct Relief International uh, Supplies. We're building a new hospital at, in his hometown, Las Cabas. And, you know, just to give you an idea of how these places look after we get through with them, I think they look pretty good myself. Feel free to applaud. I love them. Um, some of them, like this one, has been rehabbed. That's why it's got those sort of old school graphics on the front. And some of them, like the one in the middle on the top, it was just built from the ground up because the, the existing infrastructure just was not, you know, usable. And some of them we're building now on back of the napkin drawings. And the one in the middle where the palm trees are is, uh, is the one we built in 1993. And the we here, by the way, is Haitians. One of my hosts here in Santa Barbara were telling me, uh, one of them was saying, you, you need to underline again and again how these projects are run by Haitians. You know, people ask, is this sustainable? Well, I have been in Rwanda the last two years. So not only the Haitians, you know, expanding this project very actively as we're expanding in Rwanda, they're going to Rwanda to help us train, recruit and train people, the Haitians. So, and they're very proud of this work, as they should be. And I'll talk about what we've been able to do in, in Rwanda uh, shortly. But first I want to say that what we've done, for those of you who are interested in public health, um, what we've, the way we've described this is we've taken very vertical, that's what this is public health jargon, you know, the money for a specific problem, in this case AIDS, but we've used it to strengthen health systems. And so when, um, what, that, what that means is that uh, what we've refused is to say we're only an AIDS program or malaria program or a TB program. We're always trying to improve health care for poor people. And of course, when you... Just to go back to the experience of a clinician, if you're a doctor or a nurse or a social worker, especially a doctor or a nurse, and you're sitting in clinic, and your patients are coming in before they have these treatments, what they'll tell you is, Doc, I can't stand up, I can't swallow food, I have diarrhea all the time, and they'll look like Joseph before treatment. And after they're on treatment, what do you think they talk about? My kids aren't in school, I don't have enough to eat, I don't have a job, and we don't have a, if it rains, we get wet inside our house. And so this working with patients with HIV or some other problem leads us to all sorts of other problems. And the way the Haitians describe this is they use the term shwalbatai, battle horse. In other words, these AIDS programs are the battle horse 
in, to go into battle against poverty. And we have taken on primary education, the, the mobile clinics, HIV prevention, organizing communities, housing, adult literacy, clean water. And some have described this as mission creep. But for us, this is the heart of our mission. It's a social justice mission to, to make common cause with people living in poverty, to attack poverty. Yes, we're, we're trying to attack specific problems, the health problems associated with poverty, but the real goal is to attack poverty and inequality themselves. And that's what led us, of course, to Africa. It led us first to um, many of the, you know, many of the problems in, in Haiti certainly are related to uh, a loss of land, uh, to erosion, to an ecological catastrophe. And so we've gotten very involved, of course, in food and agricultural initiatives. And I'll talk more about uh, our partnerships in, in Africa, which have been allowed us to, to focus on health and public health and let others um, take on the food and agricultural initiatives. But regardless of how the division of labor goes, you need to be taking all of this on. Now, someone asked me on my first night here, the night before last, well, if you're, if you're, if you say the big problems are poverty and inequality, how is it that you're making a, a dent in these large-scale political and economic problems? And Sometimes the answer is, well, we do work on policy issues, and we do work on organizing poor people and making cause, common cause of poor people, but we also create a lot of jobs. And they're all local jobs. Um, we have, as you can see, now probably 1,250 community health workers. And it is true that this work requires a very substantial outlay of resources, but it's all Haitian-led, Haitian-run. And the problems that we saw in central Haiti 20 years ago are not the same problems that we see now. And we don't see people, women dying in childbirth in central Haiti after we put in modern obstetrics, and we don't see children dying of vaccine-preventable illness, and we don't see children and young adults dying at all. Life expectancy has changed very substantially. I, I, I mentioned on Friday night that um, I got an email here in Santa Barbara. It was, I was actually watching an email exchange between two colleagues. One, an Ameri an, she's Irish, but she is a Harvard-trained doctor, works with us. So she was up in Boston. She's on the faculty at Harvard. And she wrote to the Haiti team, how many people are on the waiting list? How many people with AIDS are on the waiting list for this treatment in central Haiti? And in, you know, shortly thereafter, the answer comes back, there is no waiting list anymore in central Haiti. Everybody's on treatment. That was, that was here two days ago. So we can turn our attention to other things, and so can the people who are on this therapy. They can work with us, like Joseph does, to help to tackle these other bigger problems and be part of the answer, as opposed to you know, dying of a, a, a treatable disease. And that's just one disease I'm using as an example. Now, what about the cost of it. What if we don't do this? And I think this is something that, again, I'm not talking about doctors and nurses and specialists. I'm talking about what if we collectively don't respond to these problems? Because the, the, um, after all, the role, as you saw with, from my Clowns, of, uh, Clowns Without Borders stint in taking care of Joseph, the role of, say, an infectious disease doctor is really quite limited in a setting like this. Because the, the way forward is, is what public health wants call programmatic responses. That is, you set up a program. It doesn't vary all that much, the medicines and doses. You, the diagnostics are easy with this particular disease. So you can get it moving forward. And it's really because people in the affluent world helped organize and fight back against this that we got the money we needed to make sure there was no waiting list for this Instead of everybody dying of the disease untreated, we now have everybody on therapy, at least in this small area of Haiti. It's not that small. It's about a fifth of the country. Now, that was a collective response that we didn't have just five or six years ago, as, as Thomas said. And it's a collective response that included a lot of Americans as well, not just as donors, but activists, you know, people who made pro-poor policy or pushed for it. 
So, but the cost of inaction is some, you know, we, this is not a rhetorical question. Well, it's a rhetorical question, but the answer has already been laid out. And I was with my friends who are here tonight, who traveled with me here uh, from Boston, and they were with me the day I took this picture. <clears throat> and they had been supporting a number of projects um, to, uh, really to, to help AIDS orphans in Africa. And they said, well, would you mind going to Kenya with us? And I did. I went several times, always to the same place, on the shores of Lake Victoria. And this is what we saw. We saw a lot of children and a lot of older people, but we did not see a lot of parent age people. There was a whole missing generation. We, we, I took this picture one day. I don't usually carry a camera, but I had a, a digital camera. Went into a school, a primary school, full of AIDS orphans. This is right near Lake Victoria. And uh, I saw this picture on the board. And I know that the teacher meant by save, do not erase. But of course, I saw something very different. And I'm sure you will too. So this has been an emergency and remains an emergency. And the this in question I'm talking about AIDS, but I just as, might as well be talking about global health equity or rights. It's an emergency. You know, maternal mortality, that's when women die in childbirth. It's an emergency. Half a million women a, dear, a year die of this, in this horrible way. And of course, many of their children don't make it because to have a mother in any country, to lose a mother is a tragedy in any place in the world, but to lose a mother in rural Africa often means yourself to lose your life. As if you're a child, or a young adult, or a teenager. So this is a very, it's, Africa was really the continent where we most wanted to expand. But we wanted the conditions to be right. We've been asked many times since we started this HIV equity initiative in 1998. Um, we've been asked to go to Africa, but we didn't think we had this wonderful mix of the right resources, the political will where we knew we could move this forward, um, and help from our Haitian colleagues. But that all came together and we went to Rwanda with the Clinton Foundation. And I'll, and I'll mention uh, in closing some other project we've been doing with the Clinton Foundation. But let me just say that we went, I went actually from this trip, right from uh, Kenya to, uh, to Kigali, and this in November of, 19, uh, November of 2004. I'd been there before, but not to really choose a site. So I went to northern Rwanda with the director of the Clinton Foundation, Ira Magaziner. And we went to a town called Ruingeri. Some of the people here tonight have been there. Because, and that's where you go to see the gorillas, Ruingeri. And I, I was in my suit. And I went and I looked at my schedule and said, gorillas with Ira. So I said, well, I don't have any shoes or anything. So I just walked up the trails with this on, which I did this morning, actually, in San Isidro Mountains. <laughs> anyway, the, the gorillas were looking at me funny. The European eco-tourists were looking at me funny. I felt very uncomfortable. Um, and so I, and I decided, where would I feel comfortable? The public hospital. So I said goodbye to the gorillas. Beautiful, by the way, the gorillas. Uh, and went to the hospital, and there was electricity, and there was... There were three doctors, and there was a lab, and there were little, another thing that strikes me as important and sort of a clue was there was a garden there, you know, lawns. And so I went back to the city with Ira Magaziner, and I said to the Minister of Health and the director of the National AIDS Program, you know, the, you, you can send us somewhere more difficult. Cause, you know, and I realized later that this is what's called public health machismo, <laughs> you know. I said, well, we're partners in health, you know, you can send us somewhere more tough. And the minister looked at the director of the National AIDS Program, they said, okay, we know just where to send you. So they said, we have just the most lovely garden spot for you. And this was Ringuavu Hospital, and my friend Cassie is out there somewhere, and saw it at this time too. It was abandoned, more or less, since the genocide in 1994. And it had briefly been, during the hostilities, a military facility, and then wounded soldiers were, they, I won't say they were treated there because they really didn't have good treatment, but when we got there, it was abandoned. And I have to say again that we sort of rubbed our hands together like Disney characters, cartoons, and said, good, we like this. This is good for us. And we got the Haitians over there, and we said we have to do three things at once. 
all at once. We have to take care of sick people. We have to rebuild the infrastructure. We have to train local people to, t to take this work over. And we did. This is a year later, the same place. And I, yeah. So I wonder what happened to that sign. I know we didn't throw it away. But uh, it makes a big difference, as some of you who have been to these places know, when you, re you make people feel that they're welcome by not having the place be dirty. Or, uh, I mean, that to me is, is the first, one of the first things that we have to do. And this is pediatrics before and after. And that's just five months, I think, it took us to, to build that, to do that. Anyway, again, these are institutional transformations, but the same kind of personal transformations that we saw with Joseph that I showed you, of course they happen in Rwanda. One of the interesting things, and maybe this will come up during the discussion and answer period, or discussion period, that sounds bad, discussion and answer. Yeah. Sorry, that's not done in Santa Barbara. It's just like process-focused, you know. Anyway, uh, I lost my train of thought a little bit. Institutional transformations. One of the interesting things that I've seen happen is when you go with a team that believes the work can be done. Now, that team was by now Haitian and American coming to Rwanda. They, they knew we could do those three things at once because they'd done it before several times. But having Rwandans start believing again in public health and medicine it takes, you have, to, you have to let them be part of the process of rebuilding this. And they were. But it was, you know, it would, then they saw experience, you know, people like this guy. This is John. And this is John. He has, again, what two diseases do you think he has? AIDS and tuberculosis. And this is only, uh, I think it's four or five months apart. I don't remember. Um, some people would say, well, that's not the same guy. Um, I've heard that before, by the way. You know, it is true that he goes from looking like Skeletor to looking like he needs Lipitor, but it is the same guy. <laughs> we introduced him to President Clinton, actually, and he was standing in front of his pictures saying, well, this was me before treatment, and this is me after treatment, which, is, which was good. That's John. So we have institutional transformations, personal transformations, not just among people like John, but among the staff. So the staff, the doctors, nurses, social workers, health workers, they start believing that this tra these transformations are possible, that you can do this, that it can work. And then they take it somewhere else. We're now, um, I don't know if any of you, th this is not far from, is it Silicon Valley or Silicon Valley? I forget. Anyway, not too far away is uh, Silicon Valley in the, where the TED group is meeting. And President Clinton talked there and he said his wish, he was honored by this group called TED, a tech group. And he said, what I'd like to do is see this work scaled up across Rwanda. And that's what we're trying to do now. And we will succeed. You know, I, I don't have any doubt. It's going to be hard to take this to scale nationally. But if there's one place where it could happen, I think it's in this country. This, by the way, the guy with the Che shirt, I love the Che shirt. This, but this, this is, is Dr. Desue, and he's one of Joseph, he's jo Joseph's regular doctor. And here, but he's not in Haiti. He's in Rwanda taking care of a Rwandan woman. I have to say that seeing his picture leads me to tell you one last anecdote. Um, and that is, I think it's about the funniest thing I've ever heard in public health. And you know, it's not a funny field. But, <laughs> I went after, remember I told you I would not go to any more of these big AIDS conferences, so the next one I didn't go to, which I did go to, was in Toronto last fall. And, uh, you know, I was going from Haiti, but Joseph, of all people, and some other patients and staff were coming from Haiti. I was going from Rwanda, rather, and they were coming from Haiti. So Joseph comes up. He's never been on a plane before. Remember he said, yeah, I never get invited to these conferences, and I told you I had my revenge on him. This was my revenge. So he comes to the conference, and I was coming from Kigali with a lot of people from Rwanda, um, and we got caught in Heathrow because it was the day someone decided that, um, you know, Shampoo would make a great bomb or something. I don't know. Anyway, so we missed our flight and lost our luggage. And I got to Toronto and I was a little bit cranky. 
And I'm not a cranky person, as I hope my friends will say. And we had about 60 people from around the world come to this big conference from Partners in Health. And uh, I said to Dr. Desiree and some of the Americans who spoke Haitian Creole, I said, look, you know, I'm tired. I've just missed my flight. I don't have any luggage. Now, mind you, I'm one of, what, thousands who've missed their flight and have no luggage. But I said, take care of Joseph and the other people you know, patients, because they've never been to a place like this before. Make sure they don't fall down an escalator. You know, I've seen all this stuff too many times. You know, I, I, was, I was being very bossy. And uh, I, I forget all about it. And about two hours later, I hear Dr. Desiree, who's this really quiet little fellow. Um, we used to call him Tipea, the little priest. And he's really intense. And he was talking to Joseph, who um, was, has on this big baseball cap. And Joseph's listening, and Desiree, Dr. Desiree is talking. He says, okay, this is an elevator, and this is how you push the button, and this is how you put the card key in your room, and then you can come here for breakfast at 9. And he gives this long list. He said, and the most important thing, and I'm listening going, don't open the mini bar. <laughs> That's how unfunny public health is, that that would be funny. <laughs> Let me just close with some reflections for the university community in Santa Barbara. Oh, this, talking about Orange County, how far is Orange County from these parts? Isn't it around here? Mum, muttering, mumbling, I don't know. Anyway, this is, uh, I, I, this, this doctor, um, his, his parents were gonna be here tonight, I don't think they are, but that's why I stuck this in. He's from Orange County, and he's working with us in Rwanda and Haiti. But I wanted to uh, talk about two things and close and open this up. First of all, some of our critics, and you know, it's, it's strange to me that, you know, there would be critics of work like this, but there are. And they're mostly, let me, if I said, who are the critics? A, patients and their families. B, um, Ministry of Health personnel. C, our peers in public health. You guess. Anyway, it's not the patients. So they love our work. But some of the stuff we have to, you know, stick up for is accompanitors are what we call community health workers. And we've been in clashes, and some of you will be, maybe squirm a little when we say this, but we've said, no, they're not community health volunteers. And, and Tom Tighe interviewed me about this for the, the Independent. And we said, but that's ridiculous. How can you ask someone who, to just to use the example I gave for, for Thomas Tighe, who's, you know, a 35-year-old woman, six kids, go and be a volunteer for 30 hours a week. She can't do that. She's got to plant millet or corn or market. So we have to have paid community health workers. And we're told that, I'm worried that people are, like, going to get the hook out or something. I'm finishing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, people have said to us, and I heard this, from a lot in, in Africa, you know, this is a gold-plated model. By the way, my brother, some of you may know this already, but my brother's a pro wrestler, or was for 10 years. I know, it's unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> my baby brother, my youngest brother. So the Haitians look at him and say, same mother, same father? But <laughs> there you have it. As he says, he got the food, I got the books. <laughs> anyway, so... He's a very funny guy. He was in Rwanda last year for the summer. And he was, you know, would do anything and help with anything. And we were at a um, meeting in a village called Rukira to celebrate the one-year anniversary of Partners in Health in Rukira. And it was a, organized by the AIDS patients, who, of course, had come back to life and, you know, were organizing these dances and poems. And I knew it was going to be long. My daughter was there, too. And I, I said, wear sunscreen, honey. And... Uh, so my brother was sitting there, and he was, I thought he wasn't listening, and I was talking to a pediatrician, an American woman, and I said, well, how did that visit go? And uh, it was a visit from a, a donor group that was full of public health experts. And uh, she said, it was fine, you know, they came to the pediatric ward, they said the usual, they had the usual critique, I said, what was that? She said, it's gold-plated. Now, I'd heard this before. But my brother almost blew a gasket. You know those cartoons with people's steam coming out of their ear? He said, what did you say? What do you mean gold-plated? How, how can work like this be gold-plated? And we both looked at him, and he said, do you mean sending kids to school is gold-plated? And we went, uh-huh. Clean water, gold-plated. 
antiretrovirals for AIDS, gold-plated. And so then he went off on this riff, which was actually quite funny, and reminded us of how arcane our debates are in public health. He said, I have an idea. Let's buy every patient a condominium. <laughs> Let's get them a sailing yacht. And then he said, no, Rwanda's landlocked. And he kept on in this vein for some time. But instead of being uh, sarcastic like my brother, Ira Magaziner suggested that we do a cost analysis and get some people in with finance backgrounds to look at how much we were spending and what the breakdown was. And here, this is what it showed. This may not, in Shuti Mubizima means partners in health in Kenya, Rwanda, which, by the way, always insisting that your local sister organization have a local name is another form of public health machismo or more anthropological machismo. So in Shuti Mubizima, PIH in Kenya, Rwanda. And so we found out that we're spending about 45% of our budget, which, by the way, for the first year was under $2 million, and we rebuilt that hospital and took care of tens of thousands of patients, including uh, many, many people with AIDS. About 45% of the budget was for labor. And I wouldn't be embarrassed. I wasn't embarrassed when I saw that. I thought, well, hey, unemployment 60%. Why are we supposed to be embarrassed? And then someone said, yeah, but 19% of the budget's for food. That's more than the medicines. And I said, well, that's because we get generic medicines and people are hungry. Next. Anyway, I wasn't the best audience. <laughs> but the infrastructure, by the way, which included the nice rebuilds of the hospitals and cleaning things up, as you can see, was a tiny part. But what we were trying to show, wasn't trying to show, we were looking and saying, look how little it costs to pay all of the hundreds of community health workers. There's less than 10% 10, 10 of, uh, of the labor costs and only 4 or 5% of the budget. And so we said, let's push this model forward. And we, you know, by the way, um, I mentioned that we always wanted to have a local name. So when we expanded with the Ministry of Health, this is all in the public sector, by the way, and the Clinton Foundation went to Lesotho. I said to one of my former students who's an infectious disease doctor, I told her, Jennifer, I says, we have to have a local name for Partners in Health. She said, well, I don't know. She's an anthropologist also with a PhD like me. And so I thought she'd say, oh, sure, you know, absolutely agree. But she said, I don't know. This is a really tough language. And I said, oh, come on, I'm sure it'll sound great. And she said, okay. <laughs> now, I can't say this, so I just call it PIH Lesotho. But um, these are our newest partnerships, and, and we... We want to continue expanding. The, we're building a new hospital in Malawi. We just finished a new hospital in the Sutu Clinic. We're trying to retrofit the clinics there so they'll be safer for patients with HIV so they won't get tuberculosis or people without HIV. And it's, it's a very exciting work. And I said I wanted to make two, two points. And one is, what about the United States? Well, we took the Haiti model and brought it to Boston, community health workers. And we need a lot more, and we need to have national health insurance in our country, but... <laughs> but we also need community health workers. And I got into trouble because I said to my colleagues when we were trying to fight for paid community health workers there, too, I said, all we're trying to do is raise the Harvard level of care to Haiti levels. <laughs> that, that didn't work out so well. That... Anyway... Uh, let me just go to a last point. Say that you're at a university in California, let's just say. Say, I made this all special like for you guys. <laughs> and this is, I thought, I didn't know how many university students would be here, or faculty or others, um, because even though Santa Barbara reads, we're not sure UCSB reads. But anyway, <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. Come on. I'm just kidding, dude. Um, <laughs> I can't pull it off, but uh, I, you know, we need to have a new way of, if we want we university people, and this is just the last little thing I'll say about university, to the university crowd, we, we need a new way to be in a place like Africa. We really can't just take the, the same way that universities go about business, focusing on teaching and research alone. You have to have a service component, and it shouldn't be too small a piece of the pie. And that's one of the things that we're moving, trying to push forward in Harvard. Now, Harvard, granted, is not a public university uh, that's vulnerable to whims of politicians. 
And I know that the, this, uh, you know, the, the University of California is the best public institution in this country probably and has a lot to offer. If we, are you applauding for yourselves? Um, <laughs> has a lot to offer the world, uh, including Africa, I believe. And, but we need, we need to think about how we can um, be more effective at, at service. And we'll talk about that. In, you know, I'd love to talk about that with this community. We've got a lot of new resources out there, but we have a big problem. And, uh, and the problem is that we don't have a strategy to deliver the new tools that are being de de developed. You know, what would be the new tools? New vaccines, new medicines. We don't have a strategy. We need those community health workers out there. We need a local people to have taken up this, this work and they have to be, we have to support them so that they can do that. Otherwise, we're going to have a bottleneck. This is what we've got already, actually. You get new technologies, new money gets stuck because we're not good at actually delivering services to people living in poverty in places like Africa. Even if you look at the budgets for some of the major initiatives from the United, that are supported by the United States, about half the money goes to consultants, American consultants. It doesn't ever get to poor villages. It hardly gets out of the cities. And this is a very significant problem where I think the citizenry of our country would have a lot to say. Well, I, I, I'm going to stop here and open this up for discussion, and I'm looking forward to having a proper discussion with the lights up. Thank you very much.